So I had all my toes fused. So they basically break all the bones and then they put pins in your toes. And yeah, I had some muscle transfers at the same time in my ankles. Yeah, it was pretty major surgeries. Today, we're talking about growing up with rare conditions, wearing braces, and finding good resources in new places. Our host, Monica, is joined by Lisa Weiner, an advocate for the education, awareness, and research of her rare condition. Your disorder is something I've never even heard of. So I'm going to start there. So I'm not surprised. That's that's why I wanted to write you. So yay. So Lisa, please, please help me because I was going through this. So I, I, how did I never hear about this disorder? The next thing I'm, I'm going to want to call my doctor about later. Yes. So it is a very weird, strange name that most people haven't heard of. It's called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. And it's just named after the three French neurologists, their last names. I mean, sort of like Alzheimer's, which everybody knows that was the last name of the man. But, you know, it is a funny name, Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. It's actually one of the most common forms of peripheral neuropathy. So oh. it's, yeah. It is, but it's still considered a rare disease. But for rare diseases, it is on the more common side. However, it sometimes takes a while for somebody to get diagnosed with it. It's a form of peripheral neuropathy. It's sensory and motor loss. And it's the myelin sheath around the nerve, which you could think of as the protective layer. That's basically the connection from the nerves to the brain and your peripheral nerves starts to break down. Sort of like, you know, like an electrical wire when it starts to peel away, when you're trying to use that electrical wire, it doesn't work as well. So it basically takes longer for the messages to get to your brain and that causes the sensory loss. And then because it's not reaching your peripheral nerves the way it's supposed to, then you have the muscle deterioration as well. So it's a slowly progressive disease. And it goes at first, the most distal part of your body. So your hands and your feet and your lower legs is where most people are affected. Most people notice things in their feet and legs first. And there's a lot of variety though, because there is different genetic phenotypes, there's different genetic inheritance. And so sometimes the symptom, the symptomology, the way you're presented can be different. I have the most common type. We call it CMT instead of saying Charcot-Marie tooth disease always. So when I say CMT, that's what we refer it to. So I have CMT type 1A. There's four basic subtypes, and then there's A's and B's and 1's and X's. So far, I think they've identified, I think, about 100 different genetic variants. This is a congenital disease. It's a genetic kind of chromosomal thing that happens. And most people have it handed down from one parent. And it, so every time that parent were to conceive a child, there's 50-50 chance they're going to pass that gene on to their child. I have it by, quote, de novo spontaneous mutation. So I'm the first one in my family. Congratulations. So, yes, yes. And no, I'm the lucky person here, I guess. So it was a little trickier, you know, to figure out what was going on with me because I don't have that family history. And so it did start when I was about three years old, when we took our first family trip to Disneyland. I have one older brother. He's about three years older than me. We went to Disneyland and I have kind of vague memories of that age when on that trip. Just being in pain, my legs hurting from so much walking and just fatigue on my legs from walking around Disneyland because, you know, that's the first time you're really doing so much walking, I think, at one time. 
And I cried a lot, I guess. And my parents carried me. And so anyways, that was kind of the first, because otherwise I, I was a normal kid and I walked at a normal age. I had all the same like developmental stages, you know, crawling, walking. But after that Disneyland trip, my parents took me to the pediatrician and then an orthopedic surgeon. And I just kind of began my journey of doing a lot of walking back and forth down to doctor hallways for them to kind of watch my gait and see what was going on with me, why my legs were hurting, just exactly what was happening. So anyways, the first major thing was that I was born with very high arches and very tight Achilles tendons, which is very common with the condition. But again, I, I wasn't diagnosed with CMT yet. But finally, just before I was seven years old, they decided to do bilateral Achilles tendon lengthening surgery. And it was very traumatic for my parents to decide to do that because it was really major surgery. I was in the hospital for a week. Even though it was traumatic, you know, kids are resilient. I tell my parents that it was really one of the best decisions that they could have made for me because it really, really did help. It was, it was hard. They told my parents I was going to have two casts under the knees. I came out with two casts up to my hips. So that was challenging, you know, was, and I, we lived on this big hill. <laughs> but, you know, kids are resilient. Once I could walk with the walking cast, they put like these heels and I could walk on them. Finally, you know, I had girlfriends in the neighborhood and I would go next door and play with my friends and stuff like that. Anyways, um, I recovered from that. I was a very active kid and I danced a ton. I know you were a ballet dancer too. I love dancing. That's really was my passion. And I think that helped me a lot. So I was always kind of clumsy, but no one really knew anything else specific that was going on with me. Finally, when I was in junior high, about age 14, they were testing for scoliosis. And not everybody has spinal issues, but it is also, for whatever reason, a common thing that a lot of people with CMT also have scoliosis or something called kyphosis. Scoliosis, many people know, curvature of the spine. So I was found to have that, and that kind of began my journey of going to Stanford Children's Hospital for my treatment there, because I, I grew up in the Bay Area. And getting treated for that and the orthopedic doc who, who helped me with my back. So those years during my teenage years, he, he noticed all these symptoms of my feet, sort of these very high arches and what they call a drop foot and my, my weakness in my feet and how cold they were because like I had mentioned, it's sensory motor, very cold hands, cold feet, the circulation doesn't work as well. Anyhow, he noticed all these symptoms, asked my mom a lot of questions about any family history. And I went to a neurologist for the first time because he thought I had this condition called Charcot-Marie tooth disease. And so back then, this was in the early 80s, and they didn't have a genetic test yet. So there is a genetic test test because they have identified the gene for my condition. But back then they didn't. So it was mostly by nerve conduction tests and just examination and then something called an EMG, an electromyelogram, which is not necessarily a fun test for a lot of people. Not how so you fun. have that. Yeah. You have that. <laughs> There's very few tests you're gonna come through that oh. I'm not like, yeah, I've heard oh, that God. one. So nightmares about that one. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, yeah. This really feel that. Yeah. So I had the electromyelogram and that confirmed it. Well, it struck a yes. loss that you were by Stanford. It's just oh my gosh. insane to me. Like that you didn't end up like at you know, 30 or 40 still like looking for an answer. And that's just I mean, Stanford is I, an, a very interesting institution. <laughs> and they're, I have to say very right. good with like weird stuff. I, I'm very blessed listening to your, your program and your podcast and, and hearing so many people's stories, not having good experiences with their physicians and their providers. And I, for the most part, have, have knocked on wood, been very, very fortunate and have had really, really good physicians. For the charcot marie tooth disease, yeah, once they identified that, my orthopedic docs, they've all been just stellar, really, really wonderful. 
what you're talking about is why I brought up Sam for being so good with rare disorders is that we're talking to people all over the world and right. they don't, a lot of people don't have, you know, like you're living in Nebraska or in Oklahoma or in Russia or in India or in Africa, you might not have access to a doctor who's heard of this and you've done an incredible job. You know, even like living in San Francisco, I had never heard of <laughs> Like it's a rare disorder. It's part of what I love about doing this podcast is there's been three people have been diagnosed just from listening to those podcasts and by their doctor going, I heard this podcast with these symptoms. So you've done such a great job of explaining what you had that people can look out for and bring this to their doctors because obviously every GP does not know every disorder that's ever existed. Right. It's really helpful. I know when I was sick, I had like a billion weird symptoms from like, am I crazy? Am I some sort of weird like genetic experiment that went horribly <laughs> awry? Like what happened here? And so I've watched all the like house doc, the house documentaries, the house show as a documentary and like Grey's Anatomy and all these shows oh my just gosh. to see if someone came in with these symptoms that I could go, okay, now I can ask about this. Right. Right. I was very privileged to go to Stanford and have wonderful docs there. So even though I had this diagnosis at age 14, then in kind of the scoliosis treatment became the dominant thing. I was very active with dancing and there was two main treatment options, wearing a back brace or forget the technical name for it, but it was like this electrode stimulation device. It looks very similar to a TENS unit. Do you use H-Wave? I don't know if that was what it's called. And they don't know that it 100% works. Basically, each scoliosis treatment is just trying to pre prevent the spine from worsening the spine from getting any more curve during your growth. And so I wore this electrode stimulation device at night when I slept for about two and a half years from age 14 to 16 and a half. And, you know, it was better than wearing brace because physically in order for it to be effective, they told me I had to wear it like 23 hours of the day with like an hour to take a shower or something. And there was just no way because you can't dance in that. And, you know, you can't do much in that. So I chose the electrode stimulation device and I was glad I did, but I just, I had a lot of problems with it. First of all, there was these four electrode pads you had to put on with this gel and you had to get it in very specific spots. And I couldn't reach myself in all the areas so it was just very infantilizing. Like I had to have one of my parents put it on. I had to have one of my parents put me to bed, basically from age 14 to 16 and a half. And then I had very sensitive, fair skin, and I would break out in these terrible rashes just from the stimulation thing. I had all these residents and interns at Stanford taking pictures of my skin and trying to figure out how to help me and give me the most sensitive skin gel to make it work. You Just, were like a teenager. You were a young person having your body observed. That, that's a different kind of crunchy there. That, that's a lot of self-awareness. Yeah, it was a tricky time. And I was fortunate. I always have very good friends and preferred to on weekends if I could sleep over at a girlfriend's house, you know, having one of my friends put it on for me. That was always nicer than having one of my parents, especially, you know, your teen years. I was a difficult teenager at sometimes, you know, just dealing with the various things. And my parents got divorced at age 16 too. So that, that kind of came into it just with difficulty. Anyhow, I, I got through that and, okay, after my scoliosis treatment. So, you know, back then we didn't have the internet. I wasn't necessarily having any terrible symptoms, you know, because Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease is really a condition of you, you treat symptoms that you're having difficulty with because there's not a treatment. I mean, there's very few muscle diseases that have, you know, any treatment out there and that's why Muscular Dystrophy Association is huge and done so much for the world in terms of research and studies. And now we have Charcot Marie Tooth Association, which is the national association for my specific condition, which is based in Pennsylvania. And they have just really flourished and progressed since I've been involved with them. I would it's, like it's to hear more about that as well like you're yeah you're very involved in things and I'm so curious about your energy level how you got involved in this work how you managed to strike a balance with health and a 
project. I'm actually just like mining for advice is what I'm doing with this. Oh gosh. No, I I love advice from you. You seem like your energy uh-huh. is amazing. No, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> no, let me let me dispel some myths very quickly for anyone who listens to this. I was like, I should be doing this much. No, you shouldn't. No, please don't. So I am no, I do this as a pain distraction and it is biting me in the tail. And Eva came in to save this podcast because I was quitting and I had to stop because mm. I kept going to the wall. And she came in and saved the podcast. So we turned it into a network for so many reasons. And part of this is something I want to talk to you about as well, which is to we want to gain leverage to be able to eventually hire a lobbyist to work on disability rights. And we wanted to get strength in numbers to start pushing for better laws. But we really do this because we're sick and we we need more help. Like this is not a high energy situation and I constantly am on the verge of quitting. No, I actually would love to help you too with any, and I'm serious about that. So (laughs) we've been falling apart while we're talking. Yeah, Yeah. we can talk more later, but. No, absolutely. No, but I'm very curious about like how you're able to manage like what you're dealing, how you manage self-care. You're involved in a lot of things. And I really Uh, also definitely want to get to the the tech and disability because I, like many disabled people, hold out this incredible last savior hope for technology. Like technology is sort of the promised autonomy. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Shark and Marie Tooth Association. Like I said, I really, my symptoms just got worse in college, spraining my ankles all the time. I was in physical therapy. I went to UC Santa Barbara, which is amazing and wonderful. Oh, I'm jealous. That's a gorgeous campus. Yeah, it was. Yeah, anyone who does not know Santa Barbara, it basically stays, what, 75 degrees, 11 months out of the year. It's a beach town. It's got gorgeous architecture it's great food good role yeah. waiting yeah it was it was wonderful and i probably should have started wearing leg braces around that time had i really maybe known better it would have prevented a lot of injuries and falls but i don't know that i was ready physically or or i did not know that i had the confidence to do that because i was in shorts all the time and I don't know if you've been able to see what an ankle foot or so sees look like, but they're not my, the, the braces are not sexy. I mean, we really need to like, they're not sexy. Yeah. We need to like fashion up our bracing. Someone needs <laughs> to like get on this. The Ariana Fente, they need to start making some really cool like braces and yeah, we, we need to up those. The, the game needs it's, to be it's, that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's getting it's getting better. They're <laughs> now made out of carbon fiber, many of them. And that technology is so much better than the old kind of plastic fiberglass looking braces, which are definitely more just orthopedic and medical looking. So yep. those are the ones I wore for many years. So I, I sprained my ankles all the time in college, was always on physical therapy, but I just luckily kept recovering. I would get in physical therapy and then I started swimming usually. And I've always loved swimming too. And so that would always kind of be my go-to when I was injured. But after I stopped dancing, I just loved walking, power walking or hiking a lot. And I was able to do that for a long time. So like I said, this is slowly progressive and it, it varies among people that like in my 20s, I was pretty good other than ankle injuries. So I got an ankle repair surgery at about age 24, 25 in San Francisco. After that, he really wanted me to start seeing neurologists regularly and start wearing ankle foot orthoses braces. So I've been wearing braces for about 25 years now, and that really was a game changer. They're not sexy, but especially like the first time I had these off the shelf ankle foot orthoses, which uh, when you're not as progressed, sometimes that can be a mess, but those quickly started not being as effective for me. And really the best thing is to have custom braces made. And it's sort of like getting, you know, a lot of people have custom orthotics made to put in your shoes. 
well, this is not just neurosonic, but it goes all the way up kind of the back of your leg usually. And so it almost looks like they're casting you, like they're putting a leg for a cast on you and then they cut it open in the top and carefully pull it off you. And that's the mold that they use to send to a lab to make the, the braces. And they last, the older plastic kind of fiberglass looking braces, I would probably last with it about every couple of years. Fortunately, I mostly have very good insurance and they pay almost 100% of them because they're a couple thousand, anywhere from two to $5,000. I have a graveyard of braces that I tried to buy and I just discovered on Poshmark because there's a kind of brace called uh, Bowerfield and mm -hmm. there's just like the best brace company, but they charge almost $300 a brace for a lot of things. So Poshmark, oddly, the place where you go to get, you know, the secondhand clothing, they have a ton of these braces, like a Mueller and, and Bauer find. And if you saw it, it was like LR Seamless, I don't know if it would work for you, but if you're looking for the better quality bracing, you can often get them for like $25 to $50 on sites like Poshmark. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's my tip for the day because I could not afford to like test out as you can't test the braces if you order them from their site. They send it to you, that's it. You can't return them really. Okay. So, yeah, this is a way to like actually test out these 50 and sometimes up to $100, but set of them 300 Okay. And are these ankle soot or so see? Everything. Braces? So Bauer Fine does like all the bracing and compression socks for, for pots. But God, they're so expensive. But they're supposed okay. to be the best braces on the market without being handcrafted to you. Okay. Oh, interesting. And how braces yeah. help you? Do you wear like sure, sure, why not? Maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's And there's a big thing with my disorder. The PTs fight all the time on whether you should brace to avoid the dislocations or you shouldn't brace because it weakens the muscle. Right. And then I also corset it because I have permanently dislocated rib. It's this weird thing where like no one knows what to do with this disorder and no one understands it well enough. This is the thing. So I use bracing for after major dislocations. Hold things together-ish, sort of. But okay. it didn't work for me when they did the, they actually did a cast for because my wrists keep popping out. Oh, they're pretty ugly right now. And they just dislocated inside the, the brace. <laughs> and I'm like, gosh, I can't imagine. Fun times. So I love where you live. I used to live over there and I, I miss all the conversations I'd hear in coffee shops. In the peninsula? Oh my gosh. Like, it's the only thing I hated the peninsula for many reasons. I am an East Bay person. I am much more of a hippie, but. I really dug like sitting in like, there's this great little cafe near Stanford and they have the best little chocolates and salads. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The yeah. You can sit outside. Camping. Yeah. And then they have like the big, like sort of like giant couches in the back where everyone sits and like they have the best yes. scrambled eggs and toast. And like I'd yes. sit there and I would listen to people talk about reconstructing hearts and I just sit there and listen. But <laughs> the coolest <laughs> conversations would be happening there from like the newest, like I remember when Facebook started on University Avenue. That's how old I am. Like it was, that was like my wow. hangout spot. And you're in this really cool area where people are really looking at tech advancements and what they can do for disability. How did you get involved in that project? Yeah. So I lived in San Francisco and actually Marin County for a little while. Marin. Yeah. That was beautiful too. And I lived there in my 20s and early 30s. And I was actually married when I lived there. And I'm, I'm divorced now. But and so when I was living in Marin and then I separated, I decided to move back to San Francisco. My dad lives there. And that was just traumatic. And he helped me find a place. And I lived in San Francisco on my own there with my little dog. I had a toy poodle. And he's my baby. <laughs> then I finally decided to move to the peninsula because I grew up in San Mateo. My mom lives here. A lot of friends and cousins and more of a network. I, I just felt like that was probably better. And the city was getting heard for me just with my disability. That and city is gonna... not meant for disabled people. Like <laughs> San Francisco, yeah. they do not like that. Like, San Francisco likes disabled people about as much as Oakland does. So. So, yeah, so I moved to the peninsula and when I first moved and I got my first apartment, I've just been sort of lucky finally, some on my own, just researching, finding resources out there for, for people with disabilities. And I can't remember how I finally found them, but I was 
turned on from somebody to look into the Center for Independence and Disabled in San Mateo to help. I've never them. even heard of this. Where how did I lived in San Mateo? How did this happen? Like, yeah, what, what well, are they? Where were they? I think they've been around for a long time, and they have different areas that they help people with. They do have assistive technology person and they will help you with various computer issues or recommend different technology things for you. I mean, they're not, they don't necessarily have funding to buy things, but they can recommend things depending on your condition. And if you have a doctor's recommendation, I was told that they can help put in grab bars in your shower. And what happened was after I got divorced, I was having so many more problems with my feet and ankles. And I was constantly getting toe infections and having pain in my shoes and nothing really was helping. So I started to go back to different orthopedic surgeons and I ended up having major foot surgeries one at a time, six months apart, because I had hammer toes very badly, which is common with CMT. Because we have one set of muscles that are strong, which pull down the toes, but then the muscles on the top that are supposed to help lift your toes, those are atrophying. And so you become kind of clogged toed and it was causing me so many problems. So I had all my toes fused. So they basically break all the bones and then they put pins in your toes. And yeah, I had some muscle transfers at the same time in my ankles. Yeah, it was pretty major surgeries. And I had one at a time, so six months apart. So I was in cast and crutches and non-ambulatory for a while and recovering and Everybody said, I really need to get grab bars in my shower because it was really a fall issue. And he told me about Center for Independence and Disabled. And I went, you know, and they interviewed me and I got a note from my doctor. And basically they had this wonderful person come over and for free put in grab bars for me Wow! Um, in my shower. And they were amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Just I still don't understand why that's just not required in every shower. Like, it's not like. If you're temporarily abled, you might not slip in the shower. It's just so ridiculous. We don't. I guess it's like a (laughs) no-brainer. Yeah. And they have just been wonderful over the years. I had moved apartments a few times and they'll come to your other next apartment and put in grab bars there. Or they put in one that was actually drilled into the, the tile on the wall. But then they also had this other one that you've probably seen, you can buy them over the counter too, that attaches to the bathtub rail, and then you can remove that and bring it with you. So anyway, that's how I got turned on with them. And they have other services. They can help people find low-income housing or recommend resources. I think I had an initial talk with them about that. I ne- Nothing really ever transpired on that end. Then also for a while, they had a wonderful shopping, grocery delivery help. They had volunteers that helped deliver groceries. And that was wonderful. I had this wonderful couple, like retired couple that after my first surgery, delivered groceries for me like once a week. And and that was completely free. And this was all through the Center for Independence and Disabled. And I guess there's different centers for independent living. They're called different names in different cities across the country. You just have to look for them. And I I guess I lucked out that I lived right near one. So that definitely makes a difference. And then, yes, I got tuned in with the assistive technology and they've helped me with various things over the years. And the way I got recommended to work with this high school this last year for this project invent project was through the assistive technology person at CID because he he's come over to my apartment and helped me with my computer and also various things. He's great with gadgets. And when I have a lot of trouble with my hands and wrists now, and I have these blinds, I mean, just kind of normal blinds, window blinds. And, you know, the little turner that you try to open the blinds. I have a lot of trouble turning them and then pulling the lever to pull up your blinds. And I have six of them and it's just really hard on my hands. And he made this little thing. I forget the name of this, but it has a little hole 
and you could put it in the blind thing and it helps for you to hold on to. And so you don't have to hold this little teeny blind turner. Yeah. And my Your story about the fork where you're able to like add the tinfoil oh. to the fork to be able to thicken it up. When we're talking like technology, we're also talking yeah. about adaptation and there's like a lot of free things that you can just do to adapt what you have to yes. make it functional. We're yes. almost at the end of our time. Oh my gosh. So I, I just know. wanted to check in and see if there is something that you really wanted me to make sure that we discussed at this interview or. Well, I just wanted to say it just so happens that we're doing this interview in September and September happens to be Shark Go Murray Tooth Awareness Month. And this is the month that, you know, CMTA um's website and there's also HNS, the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation. They do tons of things on their website, just trying to educate people about this disease and getting the word out there to fund research. You know, sometimes it can be hard because our condition is typically not going to affect my lifespan Mm -hmm. unlike something terrible like ALS. However, it really can disable so many people like I'm on permanent disability and that's how I'm able to live. It's unfortunate, you know, it was devastating to have to give up my career ambitions. And I I, th- I think that's been the hardest thing. But anyways, it's Shark and Marie Tooth Association Month. It's the big time we try to fundraise and just get the word out there. So people can check out cmtausa.org and I can send you links and stuff oh, and I, you I might have them already it's, it's gonna be right at the very top of our show notes it's gonna be links to everything we've been discussing at least as many things as i could find and there's also a lot more we could probably just interview for about three hours i know because there is so much cool stuff that lisa has and i do have it all linked up and i'm really hoping we still be coming back for more interviews i would love that i'm yeah, so there's... sorry i probably ran no you, <laughs> if you're going to apologize to me in that <laughs> rambling I have bigger issues with that. So you're you're all good. I just want to be really mindful. Um, I'm trying to keep all the interviews to under an hour because I, I processing them is brutal when they're more than an hour. And I, I just don't have the energy anymore. I can't imagine. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on. I'm sure we'll get to see you again. I'm, I'm hoping we yes. can get you on more regularly. You have so many wonderful things to talk about. I'm so happy please. to. Oh, yay. I'm glad. It's so nice to, to reminisce about some of the places we used. Yeah, yes. stop and grab yes. that. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Head over to we do have a YouTube channel if you are curious or what we all look like, especially when I can't get to my hairbrush. So that's that's simply a moment today. If you can and you are able, please head over to our Patreon. We would like to be able to get better transcription services. We are very aware that is missing in our podcast. We understand the irony being a disability and chronic illness podcast and not having that we just cannot afford it right now so that's what your money would be going to i believe that's it so i will end with these are unprecedented times so be very kind to yourself so you can be kind to others be gentle with yourself so you can be gentle to others and in whatever way it looks like to you be a badass hope to see you guys next week thank you for joining us today to find out more about today's episode including show notes transcripts and more please visit InvisibleNotBroken.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also support this show by heading over to our Patreon or by sharing these episodes. We are non-advertising and our growth is thanks to you listeners. Thank you to our host Monica and Lisa for an incredible conversation. This episode was edited by me, Luke Spine. Last but not least, be kind, be gentle, and be badass.